Summary of Nickel and Dimed by Barbara Ehrenreich In the beginning of Nickel and Dimed, we meet Barbara Ehrenreich, a writer and journalist originally from Key West, Florida. She is having lunch with her editor, and the two of them are discussing potential pitches and article topics. She has written a lot about being poor, and when the book starts, millions of Americans are about to leave welfare because of a law passed in 1996. She wonders what it would be like to try to live on the minimum wage and says that some daring writer should try it. She doesn't think that the editor will tell her to do it. As her book project comes together, she plans to spend a month in each of three places, Key West, Portland, Maine, and Minneapolis. She wants to see if she can make enough money to pay her rent for the next month by the end of each month. If she can't, she'll give up and try again somewhere else. Barbara grew up in a pretty nice place, but all of her ancestors were miners from the working class, so she knows what it's like to be poor and is glad for her comfy, flexible writing job. She knows that her job won't be very close to what it's like to be poor in real life, since she's healthy, doesn't have kids, and is only doing this for a short time. She is just trying to see if she can find a balance between her pay and her costs. Key West is where Barbara begins. Her first goal is to find a place to live, which won't be easy since she only has $500 a month to spend. She finally finds a trailer that looks okay, but it's 45 minutes by highway from the city. Barbara wants to apply for cleaning jobs at hotels because she remembers how tired she was as a teenager when she worked as a waitress, and she thinks she's been housekeeping at home for years. She fills out a lot of applications from the Help Wanted ads, but she soon finds out that these ads don't always mean there's a job opening. Instead, they're a way for companies to deal with the fact that low-wage workers leave their jobs often. She also seems to be pushed towards service jobs instead of cleaning work. This is probably because she is white and speaks English as her first language. At one hotel, she is sent to the diner next door, which she calls Hearthside. It looks like a sad place run by a red-faced, grumpy cook called Billy. She doesn't make much more than minimum wage, even with tips. Joan, the feminist hostess, and Gail, Barbara's co-worker, become friends with her quickly. She thinks she's not smart enough or skilled enough, and she's starting to see that she's just normal in this world. She also learns more about the problems her co-workers are having, especially with housing. She sees that there are no secret economies for the poor and that everyone is living in a state close to an emergency, with some even sleeping in cars. When the tourist season is over, Barbara figures out that she won't have enough money to make it to the end of the month with her current pay. So, she gets a second job at Jerry's, a national fast food chain. It's a busy place with a moody boss, Joy. She can only work both jobs for two days before she has to quit the hearthside because Jerry's pays more. There, she makes friends with George, a Czech teen who works as a cleaner. In the meantime, management is always suspicious of her and keeps a close eye on her. She also finds out that everyone at Jerry's has to have a second job to make ends meet. She finally begs the woman at the hotel next to Jerry's to give her cleaning work. This only lasts one day, though, because that night she has a terrible shift at Jerry's. George is accused of taking, she has to deal with four very demanding tables, and Joy comes up to her and yells at her. She leaves in a huff, and her time in Key West is over. Next, Barbara picks Maine because it's mostly white and she won't stand out as a low-wage worker there. Even though the job market in Portland seems tight, Barbara finds that it's still a $6 to $7 an hour place. Also, there aren't many places to rent for less than $1,000 a month, and the ones that do are far from town. She stays at the Blue Haven Motel, which has cheap rooms that can be rented by the week during the off-season. Barbara fills out a personality test for a cleaning service called The Maids. This test seems to be designed to get rid of people who are independent thinkers and curious, but it's easy to psych out. She takes the first two jobs that are offered to her. One is as a kitchen helper at a nursing home, where she serves meals at the Alzheimer's unit, which she finds much easier than Jerry's. The other one is at the maids, where she watches a movie that shows her how to clean in a certain way. 
she is sent out with a group to clean houses, which turns out to be very hard work since they only have a certain amount of time per house. Still, it looks like most of the women don't have enough money to eat anything but snacks. Barbara is proud of the fact that she can keep up with the younger women, even though she knows that she has had good health care and a healthy food for decades. She also thinks that working as a housekeeper means getting too close to the owners and that the owners and cleaners have a very unfair relationship. At the same time, she is worried about things like her own money. She tries to get help with food, but most places are only open during work hours, which is inconvenient for the working poor. In the end, she pays $7.02 for a dinner that isn't very healthy. Holly, a team leader at the maids, gets dizzy and faints and hurts herself at one of the houses, but she refuses to rest because she doesn't want to waste Ted, the manager, s time and she's afraid of losing her job. Ted doesn't seem to care about much else besides money, but Barbara can tell how much the other people value Ted's support, probably because they don't get it from anywhere else. Barbara's last part of the experiment takes place in Minneapolis, where she interviews for a job at Walmart, which has a similarly demeaning personality test and also requires a drug test. Since Barbara has recently smoked marijuana, she has to detox, but this makes her think about how low-wage workers are looked at with suspicion and distrust. She also applies for a job at Menards, a tool shop, but turns it down when she learns she would have to stand on her feet for 11 hours straight. Again, Barbara has trouble finding cheap housing. There are no cheap flats open, so the only place she can stay is a hotel in the city that costs an outrageous $295 a week. Barbara feels like she is being indoctrinated into a Sam Walton cult at Walmart orientation, where employees are called associates and their bosses are called servant leaders. But her employer, Roberta, is careful not to talk about pay until after she has sent Barbara straight to orientation. This means that a potential employee doesn't have time to negotiate or look at other options. She works at Walmart in the area for women, where she and her new friend and co-worker Melissa are judged by how many carts they fill and return. She has to watch out for what the company calls time theft, and since she's been on her feet all day, she guards her two 15-minute breaks like a mother hen. She gets more and more angry and bitter, and she wonders how much a job like this would change her. Barbara ends up moving into a comfort inn, which costs $49.95 a night. This is a bit cheaper, but it's still not cheap, so she has to end her experiment early since she'll never be able to spend the same amount of money as she makes. She finally tries to get her co-workers to join a union, but this is mostly a half-hearted attempt that only shows her that other Walmart workers are also trying to make ends meet on their pay. In the book's evaluation part, Barbara talks about what she's learned from her experience. She has learned that no job is really unskilled, even though low-wage workers are rarely, if ever, praised for their hard work. She talks about the places she's lived and shows that Portland was the only place she could keep up with her bills, and she could only do that by working seven days a week there. Barbara says that people don't realize how desperate low-wage workers are because we usually think of poverty as being linked to unemployment. The working poor, on the other hand, have to deal with rising rents and other costs, even though there is a labor shortage in all the areas where she lived, which doesn't push pay up much. Barbara says that companies have done everything they can to stop wage rises. In the meantime, low-wage workers are made to feel ashamed and are always a target of suspicion. At the same time, upper-class people don't see them as much because they don't share their places and don't talk to them much. In the afterword, Barbara quickly talks about what has changed in the six years since the book came out. There has been a movement for a living wage, but costs have gone up and public services have been cut. In her final paragraph, Barbara telling readers what they can do to help, like donate or vote for political candidates, but she says it will take much longer to change the economic culture of the United States. About the author. Aaron Reich was born in Butte, Montana. Her childhood was spent moving frequently around the country, as her father worked his way up from mining into middle-class status. She attended Reed College in Oregon and received her PhD in cell biology at Rockefeller University. After the birth of her first child, 
she became involved in the fight for better women's health care. She ultimately became a full-time writer, breaking into the field with articles on women's rights and social justice issues. She continues to balance her journalism and book-length projects on social and inequality issues with her activism in healthcare, women's rights, and economic justice. Hope we summarized it fully and you liked it. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel so that we are motivated to create more videos.